Hello, and again, welcome to Bit Depth. I'm Santiago Ramones. Across from me is Nathan Kent. Uh, we work together, but I think that... Well, even whenever the first time that I saw you at work, I think I was like, this is a cool dude. Like... <laughs> Oh, or even the the first thing that I said to you was like the first real thing I said to you was like, "You look like a guy who listens to Modest Mouse." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, of course. Um, what do you do? <laughs> uh, I'm a visual artist. Uh, I mostly work in drawing, so I guess I'm a drawer, and I uh, <laughs> make images. So um, essentially, what I'm doing is kind of playing off of abstraction, which has been going on forever, but um, doing it kind of backwards. So mm -hmm. I make abstract sculptures, like non-forms that mimic forms, and then draw them, like, representationally mm -hmm. from life, like direct representational, so pretty accurate. Um, uh, and then I just make a lot of, like, replications on that theme, I guess, so... Uh, a lot of what I do is kind of taking traditional medias that have existed for hundreds of years and uh, kind of mixing and matching them with, like, new media that I'm, I don't know anything about or <laughs> that I'm learning about as I'm kind of playing with. Yeah. And uh, a lot of it is just that kind of superimposition of um, literally, like, layering things. Like, mm. here's an old thing, here's a new thing, I'm just going to slap it on top of it. Yeah. And you're going to have to kind of... <laughs> work it out as you look at it so man it it's hard to express visual art on an audio podcast but uh i will say that like your work is really cool and yeah you do just have to see it um i've always been like, like i told you last night i've always been kind of bad at like interpreting art like what is this trying to say um, but I feel like the stuff that you do and the stuff that you're into, uh, has always been, or it seems like does really cool stuff other than, other than just trying to say something, it does really cool stuff. Yeah. I'm a really, uh, I'm influenced by a lot of like conceptual artists mm -hmm. and a lot of process driven artists rather than like narrative artists or. Like, whenever you look at, like, still lifes from the Dutch masters from forever ago, mm -hmm. there's always these kinds of, like, symbols and things that you have to, like, pick up on, and then you kind of, like, put the pieces together to find what they're trying to tell you. And I always thought that that was kind of, like, narcissistic in a lot of ways. <laughs> that, like, I have this message as an artist that mm -hmm. other people don't, and you have to, like, solve my clues to know mm -hmm. genius or something. And um, I just never really, like... Uh, believed in the idea of the secluded genius or the artistic genius. I think, um, that it's kind of just an expression of, of the way that you see your personal perspective mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So I'm a pretty analytical dude. So I uh, <laughs> kind of do analytical things, yeah. give myself formulas and recipes and make according to what interests me. Yeah. So. Um, I want to like, break down at least um how you got to that but but at least even at the very beginning uh what brought you to art uh well i've always drawn as a kid mm -hmm. you know i grew up in the like early 90s so when i was like six years old i was or younger than that even probably i was drawing like sonic the hedgehog off of my <laughs> underwear and the teenage mutant ninja turtles and off of my backpacks and stuff and yeah i, I got really uh, obsessed with like copying and, and replications in a lot mm -hmm. of ways but i'd also like find these like themes that i'd be really interested in for some reason like i loved the story of pinocchio since i was like a <laughs> little tiny kid and just this kind of like finding the definition of life based on this kind of like this set of factors of like what is it to be alive and so like the fact that a doll could be alive or like could have human like 
qualities. It was mm-hmm. really weird and interesting. And in in the movie, there was this scene where he like goes inside this cave, and mm. the cave turns out to be a whale. And yeah. like, how could you tell the difference between a cave and a whale just by seeing if it was like motionless? And mm. these kinds of like. I don't know, the the concept of, like, a living cave. And so I just kind of, like, make these drawings and these stories as a kid that ended up evolving into, like, what I'm doing now. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of, like, a long, complicated story, but to, like, limit it to, like, just undergrad into kind of what I'm doing now. Um, after my undergrad, before my postgrad stuff, uh... I was really interested in in death and obsessed with like I don't know the psychology of death. Before I was an art major, I was a um, a psychology major, and I wanted to be a grief and bereavement counselor. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk to people about grief and and that kind of thing. So it was too uh, too heavy of a subject for me, but I would keep coming back to it in my art, and uh, eventually I kind of like tried to get completely away from it, but. Um, I was still interested in these artists like Francis Bacon and Lucian Freud specifically, or these two like British artists that knew each other and they were painters, but they had this like idea that like art was a super genuine thing that you had to like draw from life and paint from life and, um, interested in these kind of like grotesque subject matter. Mm -hmm. So I'd buy these pig's heads from Super Cow, which is like this local area market. And, uh, yeah, I'd take them to my house and put them on my dining room table. I lived with my mom at the time, so, uh, she would just come home from work and there'd be, like, dead animal (laughs) parts everywhere. Uh, and eventually, like, you just kind of, like, grow accustomed to, like, being around these things and you form kind of emotional attachments. So, um, Hmm. I would, uh, make names for them and stuff. And then eventually I just kind of, like thought about, like, how life in general, like, how they don't really have a life, I guess. Mm. And uh, I wanted my drawings to be kind of a memorial for that and, like, a funeral service in a way. So, like, drawing is, like, a memorial for the dead, like, like a ceremonial act in some ways. And then it just got too heavy because of, like, personal stuff that happened and, like, loss and things. So I, uh, but I kept the kind of, like, still life drawings and, my interest in, in natural forms and, and mimicry and kind of became more formal in some ways. Yeah. So I think that as you progress as an artist, you like go in these like ways of like more and less formal and more and less aware of yourself as a maker and like this like meta concept of, of that <laughs> and less. And so, so now my work, it kind of addresses this kind of like, pointlessness and, and hand replication and um so the piece one of the pieces that i showed you um that's up now at my show um it's called hours of work to pointless and confusing ends and basically mm-hmm. it's just me drawing from a drawing from a drawing from a drawing and the original was made a drawing made from a sculpture mm-hmm. and eventually i just kind of like um kind of like made the system that objectively omitted information as it went in the sequence yeah. and it would be nothing at the end yeah. and kind of to illustrate this concept of absurdity. I yeah. guess. <laughs> so that's really cool. Um, the other question I was going to ask, because I, I do want to get back to, um, like specifically what you're saying in your art, but then it's also like still the beginnings. So right, like, yeah. um, why did you choose this over like what some people would say, like more concrete or productive or whatever? Oh, like a different, like a real job. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just, I guess I have like, an entrepreneur's brain that whole like old adage of i'd rather put like 80 hours of work doing like working my ass off to try to make it than to do like 40 hours a week of just normal ass shit uh (laughs) 
I, yeah, I just can't do it. I'm always get such a baby about like a full time job and it taking away from stuff I actually like want to do. And uh, I, I always have these like ideas and I always get so like bogged down in these like routines that take me away from it. So I, I guess that's what it is. It's just me not being satisfied with yeah normal <laughs> stuff. Um, not to take away from that. If oh yeah, yeah. Are into it, but um. And then what, what's sort of like a, a struggle being an artist? Mm. It just, it's not what you would think. It's not what anybody really like thinks. I think like the biggest struggle is people seeing it, like commodifying it. Like I make work to interest like myself and to make kind of thoughts experiments and to uh, originally to like make aware things that like don't have that I feel are like disenfranchised that don't get enough like credit and I feel like the role of an artist in some ways is to bring attention to that and and all those things and I think that like my struggle isn't necessarily like that I'm not making money or whatever it's to not be like academically or intellectually like appreciated in some way like people yeah. that like go to your show but don't read your artist statement and like mm -hmm. that kind of thing yeah and i think that that's always what's kind of uh upset of me about it like since i started caring about it and being like a mm. professional somewhat artist yeah <laughs> um yeah uh, kind of going towards the like more of what your art says like um you said you said that like you you focus on um, sort of these non forms and sort of uh, recreating them. So uh, even whenever you were showing me like some of your influences, uh, that you you really like the the non form. What what's important about the form and the lack thereof? Um, well, the important thing is to know that like. I guess in my belief, humanity isn't capable of a truly non-representational image. Mm -hmm. um, we always derive meaning from anything that we see. It's just kind of like this thing that we do. We're always looking for faces and clouds and mm -hmm. and all kinds of... We're always so distracted about like possibilities and potentials and classifying and, and boiling things down and distilling things into these perfect pieces and I I guess it all goes down to like Plato and his that kind of like dualism of the world of forms and mm -hmm. everything exists somewhere in their most perfect form and the 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 idea of the quintessential I guess is what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. So to take something that at least to attempt to to take to make work out of, outside of those yeah, uh, is interesting to me to try to like. I feel like people have been representing um, since the beginning of art. Like art started as like a re representation of people and a representation of um, animals and and what we see. And to mm. try to create something completely different is, is I think it's interesting. Yeah. And to make it so, like, anticlimactic, I think, is also, like, <laughs> the biggest anti-joke. And I think that that's so much of what contemporary art is about, is something that's completely pointless and ridiculous that takes itself way too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think that that's what interests me about non-forms in general, is there's things that you could never really associate with anything but it's still made from materials that you associate with that you mm -hmm. see every day yeah. it's just out of context i yeah. guess and then to uh to make a drawing from that like you can tell that it's a drawing made from life made mm -hmm. from observation made of something that has mm -hmm. like natural conditions it like yeah. exists in a <laughs> space so it's not like a non-representational drawing like a jackson pollock or something because you can tell that it's like has some sort of form, like some sort of representation, but 
uh, for all intents and purposes. It's like uh, basically a non-representational work. Yeah. And that just kind of like addresses this sort of absurdity that interests me and kind of acts as a metaphor for, uh, yeah, I guess the day-to-day bullshit of life and so <laughs> it's like, uh, there's like a, there's like a level of conceptual art and like contemporary art that's just like incredibly highbrow and like high concept. Do you like acknowledge that or do you just not Um, care? (laughs) Well, I think it all goes back. Like, yeah, I've moved past, like, Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon as, like, influences in a lot of ways. But also, like, it's just, it's a genuine artist thing. Like, if they're genuine about their message and not just wanting to be popular or wanting yeah. to, like, follow some kind of trend. Like, Sol LeWitt is an artist that I didn't necessarily, like, reference to you, but... um uh, basically what his thing was is he would like spend all day in his studio making these recipes for these drawings and he would send them out to people mm-hmm. what he would call his draftsmen mm-hmm. and he, they would go to the museums and the galleries and basically like follow his recipes mm-hmm. so like he'd say like make a sphere like make a circle on a wall out of 10,000 lines and oh, that's geez. it so like <laughs> they would make 10,000 lines and then that would be considered a silhouette piece because he orchestrated it, right? Huh. But he never touched the piece. He never even went to the gallery. So, yeah. so that's like talking about is art the idea? Is art the thing that you see on the wall? Is yeah. art the artifact or is it separated from the artifact? Mm-hmm. And like whenever you start like getting into these like really conceptual stuff, like it starts making you think these like weird things about not just about art and the nature of art and the nature of selling things and selling art, but the nature of like life in general in some ways. Um, And those are the kind of things that that's when contemporary and highbrow art is, is valid. And in other ways, it's, it's not like um, Tom Friedman is another artist. That's a contemporary artist that I don't necessarily resonate as well with. Uh, not to take anything away from his work, but uh, he's kind of like a contemporary artist for the sake of being a contemporary yeah. artist. So uh, he once stared at a canvas for like 10,000 hours and mm-hmm. the piece was called like 10,000 hours of stare, but it was mm-hmm. a blank canvas. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like about like, does the artist's attention have a sort of weight to it? Mm-hmm. Like, does that make that piece more or less valid because I'd stared at it for a certain period yeah. of time. So, I mean, it's a good thought, but I don't know. Like it, and I think that I, that's what it comes down to. And that doesn't necessarily interest me as much as other things. So. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's, that's where, um, at least as far as popular perception of, uh, contemporary art, where it starts, getting really like meta analytical, uh, sort of the stuff that like Shia LaBeouf would do or something. Um, that's where people get like, yeah, they they laugh at it because it's like, well, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but it's also saying something. Mm -hmm. Um, and (laughs) it's, it's still, it's still doing the same thing. I think Mm -hmm. like by, by causing you to think about those things that they intended you to. Yeah. Um, and there's like a whole lot of philosophy behind art. Like Mm. I feel like there's, um, like a lot of artists aren't just artists. They're also trying to make you be a philosopher with them. (laughs) Yeah. Um, well, what is it with, like, what's the connection between art and philosophy to you? Oh, wow. Um, well, an artist is never just an artist and it's been that way. Like a visual artist is never really just a visual artist. And it's been that way for a long time. Everybody seeks like these kind of like meanings in there and, and visual artists are very aware of that. So me not necessarily putting these symbols in my work is kind of a statement 
in and of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a lot of ways, people are still looking for symbols and the fact that they're not there. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like a statement as if like I'm asserting my view of visual art. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's always been connected, uh, especially in like fine art contexts, uh, from the beginning. So the role, I think that a visual artist and an artist in general, in a lot of ways, like you could consider like John Cage and mm -hmm. a, a philosopher. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think that it necessarily like, there's not a, a split there. I think it's, uh, kind of like both. Not all yeah, yeah. philosophers are visual artists and not all visual artists are philosophers, but there's definitely like a vast majority of visual artists that are also philosophers in some ways. Um, even scientists are visual mm -hmm. artists and, and that kind of thing. And in a lot of ways, the fact that they choose to like come out of their laboratories and make art is yeah. uh, choosing to connect with philosophy in some mm -hmm. ways. So. Do you consider yourself to be a philosopher in some ways in some ways yeah i guess uh i i'm influenced by philosophers and i i'm influenced by conceptual artists so i guess in a lot of ways i like have to be versed in philosophy um but i think that it's so uh elitist in a lot of ways all, yeah. all philosophers and they're so like redundant and pedantic that it's kind of like <laughs> you can't really connect with them so I guess in a lot of ways it's like I'm offended by myself calling myself a philosopher because <laughs> so I'd like to be more approachable, but I realize that I'm not necessarily that much different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, e exactly. Cause I, I, if I do think of someone who is a philosopher, they're sort of like, well, now you have to reference just this yeah. giant well of just philosophical ideas from the beginning of time and if you don't then you're just not a good philosopher or something well and it's also that going back to what i was talking about about the secluded genius like mm -hmm. a philosopher is somebody that sits around reads books instead of talking to people mm -hmm. and writes the most like redundant shit <laughs> like yeah there's good points but you just keep like re-emphasizing the same point over and over again mm -hmm all alone it's like an echo chamber that mm. never ends so just kind of like but i think that uh, technology in a lot of ways are people are having it's more philosophy has become more conversational it's yeah. more like between multiple people and it's less like arguments in a lot of ways and i think that people aren't necessarily philosophy is is all about the arguments it's all about white dudes disagree, disagreeing with other white dudes yeah, yeah. and arguing with each other <laughs> in essays. So. But I think it's changing, and I think that that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, at the same time, like, um, the uh, going back, like, you, you can be a, a visual artist without being a philosopher per se, but uh, in the same way that whenever you are... Um, putting your art to cause people to think about stuff. You're, you're sort of like mm. making people think of the things in the way that a philosopher does. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely resonate with certain philosophers that think that challenge me, I guess, maybe like have similar like logic patterns that I do. So I relate to them, but also like think differently enough that I can, disagree with them, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I think that like some of the French existential existentialists like, uh, Sartre and Camus and, and that kind of stuff. Like mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff, the contemporary stuff is what I, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I'm sort of going back to, I guess myself, but like how I'm sort of bad at interpreting art is is there a a difference between um what your art is trying to say and what your art is just like doing so like do you respect whenever someone um looks at your art and goes hey that looks cool 
as opposed to going, I like what that says? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely have an aesthetic. I feel like a visual artist is, is kind of responsible for their own aesthetic. Mm. And that's kind of the, this looks cool aspect of art. Um, but I also want to be appreciated uh, for the content. And I think that the aesthetic is just part of the content. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be appreciated for everything that you're putting effort into, yeah, yeah. which is the whole thing. Um, but no, I'm never like offended. I think I, what I like about what I'm trying to do in my attempts of, of the art that I make is that everyone is kind of right about it. Like somebody can look at it and be like, this doesn't make sense. And like, why would anybody like do this? This is stupid. Like, yeah, yeah. of course that's exactly what it's about. Yeah. But if somebody wants to take the time to think about like why I would do it and think about and can make these connections with like, well, he could be like having a 40 hour a week job and making money and eating and being fine, like, why would he go through the trouble of spending hours to do this? Mm -hmm. and, and trying to think about, like, get in my head about it and then, like, connect that to, like, what they're doing and making these kinds of, like, connections between, like, well, why do I do a 40-hour-a-week <laughs> Or, like, why do I do the things that I do? Yeah. And that kind of, like, turning, like, the lens back mm -hmm. is, is, is what I'm interested in is an artist is trying to motivate people to yeah, yeah. Um, become aware of the things that they're not aware of. In yeah. Of ways, so. um, do you think that a good aesthetic and uh, however subjective that may be, but do you think that like a good idea of aesthetics is necessary for being a visual artist or are the ideas good enough uh, for themselves? <laughs> well, people, a, a good aesthetic is a, cons, a like a consistent aesthetic mm -hmm. and, and finding. So if your thing is like, my concept is this, and that requires me to make blank canvases, like the aesthetic isn't necessarily there, but the presentation could still be there. Like sure. how high on the wall do you put it or where on the wall do you put it? Do you put it on a wall? Do you hang it yeah. on the floor? Like, do you hang <laughs> it from the ceiling? Like presentation is so much of like aesthetic and Fuck, to the that's point going to be a gallery somewhere now. <laughs> yeah. And so much of it has to do with like, like installation artists are basically like all about aesthetic in some ways, shape or form. They're not, they're all about like transforming a space to being a different space, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, so much of that is like, basically you're distilling like all your art into presentation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of designers resonate with like, with that kind of art making of like this, like aesthetic, like what's pretty like, or like mm -hmm. what's interesting or what's impactful or what makes people turn their heads. And yeah. And that's part of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there like a recipe for a good aesthetic? I don't know. There's a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about that. There's a lot yeah. of like art schools that really want you to have a solid foundation in drawing. Mm -hmm. I'm a drawer. I draw pretty well, but I put a lot of time into it. Yeah. And, uh, do I think that you need to be good at drawing to be a good artist? No. To have a good aesthetic? No. But yeah. Uh, it's kind of just like what your content's about, what your message is about. And the funny thing about that is it's always changing. Like yeah. two years from now, I might not even be drawing. So all of my drawing <laughs> knowledge will be useless. I might just, <laughs> just be like making computer programs that draw for me or yeah. make sculptures that don't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the interesting things about the show that I'm in right now is I made these kinds of like programs. Uh, I just, made these drawings that I vectorized in this program called Illustrator. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the freeware program that I used for the laser cutter didn't know how to read new Illustrator files. Oh. <laughs> so I saved it as both, um, like the newest file and the oldest file just in case. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it read the oldest file fine, but the newest file, it 
didn't know. Couldn't read yeah. it. But it would try. It would do its best. So it would come <laughs> up with this like weird like octopus squiggly <laughs> thing from the drawing based on the drawings yeah. that I would do. I thought that was the weirdest thing that it would try. Like why didn't yeah. it just think like I can't read it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but no, so I thought like that's so much of like what people try to do and it's so much like a thought without language, like like if you handed me like some Chinese manuscript, am I gonna like try to like think about it based on like three characters that I know? Yeah. Like I don't know. So yeah, that's like a piece of my show is basically just like let the program think what it did and then turn the, the laser cutter on and it printed out these like weird things yeah. and burned holes and things and That's pretty cool. Crazy, <laughs> um and then there there's a there's an obvious difference between um what can be considered fine art and like um i guess consumer oriented art like illustration and graphic design mm -hmm. and stuff um what's i guess in your view what's the difference um well that's crazy like that's <laughs> like the biggest topic in life. and there's no like we could go on for like days about that there's no like real definition and the definition that there is was established like it's so antiquated now like mm. it can't keep up with technology it can't keep up with like people and culture and so in a lot of ways art has always been the slower one Mm -hmm. It's all visual art in any way. And like music kind of defines a culture and like in a lot of ways, visual art and like food and things like that, like those kinds of like artistic endeavors, like define a culture and art. Visual art has always been like in the background critiquing things yeah, and like making this kind of like response to things. Mm -hmm. uh, but now with like the popularization of like Instagram and like, reddit and forums and all this like people are so like like can art is visual art not just like photography but visual art in general can be like so easily digestible mm -hmm. uh they it has this opportunity to assert itself as like a driving force of culture in my opinion mm -hmm. so like if people are resonating with it and liking it and communicating with it mm -hmm. that's art you know yeah. to me so like memes are art like yeah. i don't necessarily like i i read memes everybody reads memes but like that's an opportunity for everybody to participate in this kind of like mm. visual art yeah. context like putting text to like a weird image and making a <laughs> statement about life like yeah that's the artistic dream is mm. to like resonate with like everyone and to, for everyone to participate like all you have to do is know like the most basic basic of photoshop yeah <laughs> to put a text with an image and, yeah like you're golden you're an artist now so. yeah so in a lot of ways like there is no divide but then in a lot of ways like like we were talking about it's all in presentation and aesthetic like do i think that every meme needs to go in a gallery space or, or be like uh, on this like pedestal for lack of a better phrase like not necessarily but i think that we as a culture kind of like curate experiences yeah. so like there's like does is every meme good for every reason no but could you like find like five memes or ten memes mm -hmm. that define <laughs> memes as they are in yeah. 2017 of january like yeah, yeah. So almost like that Italian meme is pretty popular right now. So <laughs> yeah, or like the salt guy. Yeah, I love that too. <laughs> um, and it's great that you know we. <laughs> um, no, like memes really do, and not just internet memes, obviously, but like memes do sort of shape uh, culture, um, and in the same way, like I mean. I call dogs doggo in my head now, like, yeah. and sometimes out loud. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I mean, sort of going, like, breaking it down even to a bigger distinction, like, is, is the FedEx logo to be appreciated as much as, like, a Jackson Pollock? Yeah, well, 
it's all it's all contextual like Jackson Pollock is Jackson Pollock because he was Jackson Pollock at the time that he was mm-hmm. so like in that post war war like New York school kind of like non representational way like nobody was making shit like that mm-hmm. like that stuff was new 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 like, yeah and nobody thought it was art mm. at the time. Yeah. Um, but he was changing things and he kept with it and stuck with his aesthetic and stuck with his content and was making these action paintings where he would run around the piece and yeah. throw paint around and everybody thought he was crazy and some people thought he was a genius yeah. because he was so different and innovative mm. and people had been painting portraits. But with the advent of, with the popularization of photography and the invention of um some of these ways of getting things around like um yeah it just it you didn't need to make portraits anymore yeah you didn't, you didn't have to paint portraits like yeah. the role of an artist was different yeah um but those portrait painters from back in the day were making comments on society mm-hmm. but contemporary artists now just are a lot more direct about it mm-hmm. in some ways so. yeah um a very bad bridge into the second segment of the podcast, but I will make it anyways. What do you believe? <laughs> um, well, I think, like, I don't necessarily have, like, any, like, interesting, like, beliefs, but I think that one thing that I've kind of realized about life from being somebody that's just gone through uh, art school and and just being somewhat educated and seeing life in general and the political scene and all that. I I think that just fighting, like making a conscious effort to not be cynical, Hmm. like critique all you want as long as it's productive. But when it starts being like paralytic and you start doing nothing or shutting yourself away from the world or starting only talking to people that agree with you completely and that kind of stuff, like, that kind of cynical mindset doesn't really help anybody, doesn't change anything and doesn't really help yourself. And eventually you're just going to like live day to day waiting mm-hmm. and waiting is the worst. So. <laughs> um, and then like, as far as your beliefs in like spirituality or anything like, uh, at least to start, do you believe in God? Uh, yeah. Uh, it gets, Kind of complicated. I was raised um, Southern Baptist, uh, kind of. My <laughs> parents didn't really practice, and then I kind of got into it in high school and kind of got out of it. Uh, a lot of it had to do with politics. I was tired of... Uh, I went to college. Um, my freshman year of college, I was uh, active in this thing called the BCM, which is like a Baptist collegiate ministries kind of like yeah. club or something. And, uh, yeah, I was really into it, did, like, Bible study stuff. Um, I was really active in my church, too. Uh, read the Bible. I was always interested in reading. And, but, yeah, so I uh, was active in this thing called the BCM, and they sponsored this group of people to come that were crazy pro-life. Mm-hmm. And I was never really, like, pro-life. I was always kind of, like took a neutral stance on that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But they've made these, like, giant posters, like, on these, like, displays. Mm-hmm. There's, like, ten-foot posters of these, Jeez. like, pronounce of dead fetuses next yeah. to dimes and bloody, like, mm-hmm. stuff. And I was like, where is the love in this? Like, yeah. where is the acceptance in this? And I got so, like, kind of, like, taken aback. So I went and talked to the director and... I was like, so do you guys support this? Like, you guys brought these people here. Like, is this mm-hmm. what you guys agree with? Yeah. And I was like, because I don't. Like, yeah. I, I can't agree with this. You're like, you're alienating people. You're making people feeling feel guilty about having abortions. Mm-hmm. And like, that's a really complicated issue. Like, yeah. it's a really personal thing mm-hmm. that's different for everyone. And it's between like them and God was always like my kind of philosophy. Like, anyway, but they were like, well, not necessarily, but you know, they're with this program that funds us, so we have to support ah, them. Geez. And I'm, like, funding, like, yeah. that's what dictates morality. And so I just kind of walked away from it. And 
you know, like my church was really active with that same like place and, and yeah, I just, I, I couldn't be a part of it and just kind of like left and never went back. As far as like being a Christian is concerned, like, uh, I'm not, I don't really associate myself with that anymore, not just because of like that experience or like the people or anything, like I have nothing against Christianity. I just, I don't necessarily know if like I believe in Jesus as much per se or anything like that. But growing up in Oklahoma, you always have this kind of like conversation with people that yeah. kind of resonate with that. Um, but, um, anyways, you're like, yeah, I believe in like some kind of a higher power that dictates mm. things or started it off. But I tend to take this kind of like existential view of that, that like, if he is there, then he doesn't really like, he's not necessarily interested in communicating with us or if he is interested in communicating with us, like why doesn't he approach us at our terms in yeah. some ways or make an effort to initiate like this kind of conversation. So I guess I just kind of got offended in that way and then just kind of accepted like it for what it is. And, yeah. You know, like I don't necessarily judge it. Um, but I also doesn't, don't, I'm not like interested in pursuing some kind of like relationship with yeah. it. If it's not interested in pursuing some kind of relationship with me. <laughs> so it gets like complicated, but I don't think that, I think that it's impossible to like completely deny, like to be like a complete, like militant atheist and mm -hmm. be like, there is no God because how could you prove that? And at mm -hmm. some point I think, militant atheists are so concerned with there being no God and proving to other people that there's no God that why do they spend so much energy on something that they don't believe in? And mm. it seems kind of pointless in that, but yeah, I mean, and shit just gets complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, to, to another extent, um, being a Southern Baptist sort of formulated your, morality yeah i could say that uh-huh um so where does your morality sort of sit around now uh well i think that i kind of believe with i'm in line with thinking of sartre and his kind of existential philosophy of like we decide our own morality we're not without it um but it's up to us as people to be Mm -hmm. people that decide what's right and wrong and it's up to society to kind of in a lot of ways try to formulate these kinds of laws based on not necessarily popular opinion but um i don't know i think that society i'm pretty optimistic in large part mm -hmm. so i think that society and is primarily like altruistic. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the whole reason why we've lasted as long as we have. Mm -hmm. If we were really like against each other and in true competition all the time, then we wouldn't have made it this far. We would have yeah. killed each other by now. Sure. So not to say that we won't kill each other in the future. <laughs> but, uh, so I think altruism is kind of what guides us like this kind of golden rule of like helping people and helping ourselves and everyone benefiting from doing good mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how does, I guess, how does that altruism help you sort of face day-to-day -day life? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think that, like, being friendly and, and trying to help people out, I think in a lot of ways, as new agey as it sounds, you try to you kind of attract things to yourself. Like mm -hmm. if you're positive and you're helping people, then people are going to be more apt to help you and people that you're, you're going to be more apt to find relationships with people that mm -hmm. benefit you. And yeah. I think that that's at the end of the day, like people want to be benefited and they want to benefit others. And I think that you find a kind of purpose in that. So uh, even like I'm the kind of person that wants to be 
smiled at in public yeah. and, and, and treated nicely on the phone and whatever. So <laughs> I'm not the kind of person that's going to cuss at random people or go to a grocery store and yell at people for stuff being spoiled when it's not the cashier's fault. Yeah. Kind of thing, so. but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then your, your art has a lot of, um, like it says a lot of stuff about, um, sort of the way that we face day to day life. And so, um, how does that reflect onto the way that you live your life? Well, uh, I guess, uh, my art isn't necessarily like, my art is like a product of my life, but in a lot of ways I don't really think about, like, I don't like walk around with a sketchbook and like make all these ideas all the time. Like I'm not that kind of artist and I'm not like the kind of artist that, um, thinks about like has thoughts and tries to like translate them into like a visual context in order to express, like to like share that with somebody in a way that's like, I want you to change your life based on my experience kind of thing. But, um, I do think that it affects my life in the way that, I'm constantly doing it. Yeah. Like I'm a maker. So all my life is centered around like, like the act of drawing in like a formal sense. Mm -hmm. So like some moral and ethical things come out as me being a person, but it's not that I like inject them in there with mm -hmm. the purpose of them, like coming out. They just kind of happen because I'm feeling as I'm making and I'm, a maker so I'm always making yeah. in some ways and I'm such like a process driven artist that uh, a lot of like what I do is so formal like the fact that I'm drawing from a drawing from a drawing like it's like hours of work uh, to basically just enjoy the act of drawing like yeah I could be drawing anything yeah so um so, I mean, in that sense, you, do you think that you put yourself into what you make or, or does it, um, like, does it reflect you, I guess? Uh, I think it kind of like is a reflection. I think it goes back to what we were saying about, or what I was saying earlier about like people can't separate this kind of like humanity from anything like there's no true non-representational image and i so i think that everything is kind of this kind of reflection of everything that i make with my own hands is a reflection of me it's a decision you know mm -hmm. i choose to draw in a certain way with a certain material i choose to like put another material on top of it that's a reflection of like yeah my process that's how i approach mm -hmm. drawing that's like my perspective on things so I make like certain decisions that like to other people don't necessarily make a difference, but to me is in a lot of ways, the whole point of the work. Mm -hmm. so. Um, I mean, I guess in a sense, like, do you do art to express yourself like yourself or do you do it to express something <laughs> so, since you're so process driven, you know, mm, I, I, I guess I've never really like thought about it in those terms. I feel like for me, no matter what I'm doing, art is just almost an inevitability. I think that everybody in most of the things that they do is making art of some degree as long as they're like present doing it. So me drawing is what I choose to make as my like method of making art. Um, so I guess in a lot of ways, like I make art because I make art and I choose to make the art that I make because of who I am. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah yeah well i mean it sounds redundant but yeah it makes sense <laughs> yeah. um do you think that there's um 
maybe like a do you try to make people be better through what uh, you're doing <laughs> i don't know people can people are going to be who they want to be i don't i don't try to change people's minds generally i'm so like non-confrontational in my own life and in in my art and in everything that like if somebody's going to come and talk to me about something that I'm not going to try to change their mind about it. And yeah. if it's too like out there, then I'm probably just never going to talk to them again. <laughs> I'm not the type that's going to be like, you're disgusting and you shouldn't be thinking those thoughts. And mm -hmm. I'm just the kind of guy that's like, okay. And then like walk away and like never <laughs> talk to them again. Yeah. So no, I'm not trying to change people. Like, am I trying to like, make people like aware of certain aspects of themselves and maybe that changes people like possibly like, am I trying to like inspire those kind of like mini epiphanies, like tiny epiphanies? Like, yeah, I guess in some ways, like I am trying to change people with my art, but it's more putting them in a position to have thoughts that might potentially change themselves. Yeah. So. Um, do you think that people should try to be better? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think so. I think that, like, like I said, like, the more, like, altruistic each of us individually are mm -hmm. as a society, the better we all are for it. And, you know, fighting people and, like, judging people based on ridiculous qualifications and... Like, none of that makes sense, like, yeah. when you, like, really, like, boil it down. And I just, I I think that everybody should should try to be better and <laughs> should try to, but I think that life is, I guess I do approach life in some sort of, like, how I approach my art. I think that it's so much like a process, and I think that every, like, decision and conversation is, is this kind of, like, evolution of yourself and... It's a really like humanistic a way of approaching it, but I think that we're it's all about progress and you know moving forward and not moving backwards and challenging yourself to look at the world and through other people's perspectives and to live a life of empathy and mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that's that everybody should should try to do that yeah <laughs> so. um. Forgive me for getting, I guess, sort of uh, quasi interpersonal, but like um, your your wife is an artist. Mm -hmm. um, how how does your relationship dynamic work? Being the same sort of artists. Oh yeah, I don't know how I could do it without her. Honestly, um, there's just so much like stuff with being an artist like have people have this like romantic idea of what it means to be an artist like mm. like people from the outside think like oh you know i just want that sensitive quiet like artistic type or whatever and boil it down <laughs> to this like genre of person or this archetype <laughs> but what it really means is like i'm gonna go to work and then i'm gonna come home on top of work i'm gonna hang out and then i'm gonna stay up until like four in the morning like drawing mm. and like doing stuff and yeah. you know like i'm probably not gonna want to hang out with friends today because we have a show and like or i have a show in like a week and i need to draw and sure people outside of that like don't really they would think that it would get in the way and it does yeah. and i'm not gonna like but i'm i'm kind of a homebody anyway but um yeah like it's it's strenuous and it takes a lot of work and you put a lot of thought and hours and you do a lot of writing and you do a lot of reading and there's a lot of like putting yourself out there and for like an introvert it's like kind of uncomfortable and you have to have a lot of conversations with people about your work and not all that's not always comfortable either and it's just like to have somebody that who's also like comes from a similar perspective and is also a similar artist too. I feel like if I was an artist and I had like a significant other who was also an artist, but they were making like figure based art or something, then they wouldn't necessarily understand like where I was approaching like, mm -hmm. my philosophy behind art. 
but she like does layering and a lot of our work kind of feeds each other's work in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. We approach like layering in similar ways and um, like the nature of like organic forms versus geometric forms and our visual language is similar and just different. Like mm -hmm. we're doing similar things, but from two different perspectives, I'm a lot more analytical and she's making like non-representational art about like the nature of grief and she works with in her day job she works with alzheimer's patients and mm. so a lot of her work is kind of like influenced by those kinds of interactions yeah uh so it really like our energies feed each other on story short mm -hmm. and i feel like if i was in a relationship with somebody who wasn't an artist not even somebody who like like they have to be in some ways like similar to me in that to be able to empathize with my point of view i guess yeah and um i just need sometimes i'm kind of like a weak person i guess so <laughs> i need somebody there not to like a form that i'm doing a good job like i always support the work and if it fails then that's part of it you know but to support me through the making of the work and to give me energy and in, in making and i think that a lot of people think that like having a wife or having a kid like takes energy away from it but i think that that just feeds it in mm -hmm. a lot of ways yeah um do you think that since your your work sort of influences each other so much is is there a sense of like your work is almost also hers too yeah and vice versa <laughs> in a lot of ways uh she works really large i work really large so there's just certain things that we can't do by ourselves mm. like so she'll if she's making a grid like a complicated like grid system on like one of her five foot pieces like she can't hold two sides of a ruler and draw a line yeah so like there's always this kind of like collaboration in that way but like behind her work like it's her idea like she's the decision maker she's the driving force mm -hmm. and like i'm just there to be a set of hands yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in my work if i need her to like help me line something up or like help me hang something like I'm the one that makes the decisions about my work and like in a lot of ways she's just a really patient set of hands in, yeah. in that way so but we're also like critiquing each other's work constantly like living around each other's work making work like there's just questions that come up like does this look like this you know like is this line straight like should this be more straight is it cool that it's blue is it cool that it's yeah not as blue mm -hmm. and my kind of perspective informs her perspective yeah so if she asks me a question and i have an opinion about it and that makes her make a compromise mm -hmm. like i don't like this but you like it so maybe i'll keep part of it yeah you know, that's the kind of thing that that's the reason why our work becomes like influences and in, influences each other it's not necessarily like because it's like a super romantic, like bubbly, like we're in a relationship. <laughs> so our pieces look the same or something. But, yeah. But if you looked at our work, like we approach it in such a process driven way, we approach it in like different, like the same way in a lot of ways, but the work looks totally different. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, I think, I guess the last thing I want to, um, since I asked you about this over text, but like, uh, it's a lot easier to communicate this. Uh, why Australia? <laughs> oh, uh, well, in a lot of ways, um, she had just been really interested in art therapy, um, for obvious reasons, because her work is about, um, communicating grief and, and through visual means. So like making visual art about like feelings, like, just makes it's like the next logical step to like also be an art therapist and mm -hmm. so she read this some of the work by this professor there the director there 
in Parramatta, Sydney, about her perspectives on art therapy. Her name's um, Sheridan Monell, I believe. Mm. Um, but yeah, so she just, we kind of shot for the moon. She applied there. We got accepted. That was the only place she applied. And uh, yeah, we got accepted. We got our visas. <laughs> We're going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, without getting like way into the logistics of what it means to move from one fucking continent to another fucking continent. Uh, <laughs> uh, how do you do that? <laughs> um, I, it's a lot of like triaging, you know, you gotta <laughs> like, you don't have much time. So like certain things in life are more important than other things. And that's just the long and short of it. Like you have to make a decisions about like who you give your time to and what you give your time to and what's important to you and um, just how you're going to finish it all in the time on that. We leave yeah. nine days and we're still trying to figure out, we're still trying to like price compare like different shipping companies and yeah, like random stuff like that. Um, and there's just like, it's kind of weird. There's like so much stuff that you don't want to keep, but you feel obligated to keep. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in some ways you just kind of want to be done with it because you've been looking at it for like two weeks and you're just like, you know, I don't even care. I just yeah. give it away. Yeah. Or donate it and then be, get, be done with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so just <laughs> going through your whole life is kind of weird. Yeah. From like adolescence to adulthood, like... I guess I'd kept some like visual journals of whenever I was in high school mm -hmm. and like in middle school. And, you know, I graduated in 2008, so it's almost been 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just like, I haven't even thought about high school in like years Yeah, <laughs> and to go through all that stuff and to go through like all these like childhood, like photos and families. And it's just weird. Yeah. I keep saying weird, but yeah, there's just yeah, not yeah. really another way to express it. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, how do you think um, this will influence uh, your work? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's really no way of telling. My work is so influenced based on, like, my kind of philosophy on, on life in some ways and this kind of like notion of the absurd and notion of art as in, in conceptualizing like representation like the pipe is not a pipe stuff mm -hmm. um, so yeah I mean like I, I I can't foresee it being like that drastic of a change mm -hmm. Um, but if I was like a landscape painter or something, it would, yeah, yeah. It would change it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I don't know. It's going to be totally different. Um, so yeah, she's going to school for two years and then I'm going to find like an MFA program, master of fine arts program mm -hmm. over there and, uh, uh, just be a better artist, uh, keep making stuff, try to get shows. It's a bigger artist venue. Yeah. It's a bigger city artist flock to like urban centers yeah um so yeah basically what i'm going to try to do is just learn a lot more about computers and technology and yeah mesh it with what i'm already doing now cool <laughs> i think part of the progress of like being making art is like realizing what your strengths are uh keeping those and then adding stuff to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so like finding some like weaknesses that you have and making them strengths yeah. eventually and keep going. So once you get bored, you just find something you know nothing about and <laughs> slap it on top of what you're already doing. Cool. Um, Nathan, thank you for 
doing this podcast. Uh, where can we find your stuff? I think this podcast will go up in like three weeks, so it's probably like after your show is over. Yeah. Um, well, I I have a domain, but I changed my name uh, whenever my wife and I got married, so mm. I'm still like making a website with my new name. And uh, so I don't have a website right now, but I have an Instagram. Yeah. Uh, which in a lot of ways is more useful than a website anyway. Yeah. Because <laughs> everybody can see it. I think yeah. having like a formal website is kind of like almost archaic at this point. Uh, it depends on where you use it for, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what's your Instagram then? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's... Nathan M. Kent. I can't remember if there's any <laughs> dots or anything. I mean, dots or underscores periods, or whatever. Or... It's always the worst. Because mine uh, has an underscore. <laughs> Nathan underscore M. As in monkey underscore Kent. K-E-N-T. All right. <laughs> um, that should be easy enough to find. Uh Again, it's hard to represent what art looks like through an audio <laughs> podcast. So you really just have to see it to kind of understand what the heck we've been talking about this entire time. Um, yeah, uh, again, thank you. And I'm Santiago Ramones. Uh, I do have the archaic website, which is SantiagoRamones.com, where you can find the music that I make um, and this podcast. I always end every podcast. Uh, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Um, it does help uh, whatever statistics or whatever if you um, rate and review this podcast. Um, and even just, like, contact me. Like, I don't even know who listens to this. <laughs> um, but, I mean, if you do, just, like... Say hi, say you like the podcast, say you don't like the podcast, be like, man, it sounds like awful or something. I don't know, just tell me something. Um, but I would appreciate some feedback. And uh, now I always end every podcast with my three things, which 